All right, folks, good evening. Uh, welcome to Greenfield Community College. My name is Michael Day. I'm the state representative for the 31st Middlesex District, which, for all of you who don't know, consists of the towns of Stoneham and Winchester, way out back east, north of Boston. Uh, tonight, I'm going to provide you a little bit of background on why we're here, what we're doing with this tour. Uh, I'll introduce and hear from our panelists. We'll hear from our legislative delegation here, and then open it up for questions uh, and comments from the audience. So as I've said before, this is the third stop on our tour. As I've said on the others, we are uh, very lucky to live in Massachusetts for a host of reasons. Um, for tonight's purposes, uh, I'll mention that we have the lowest rate of gun deaths in the continental United States. We've got a strong network of laws that encourage responsible gun ownership and a common sense system that preserves our residents' constitutional rights while also ensuring the safety of our communities. The system, as we all know, is far from perfect. Uh, from the United States Supreme Court, which has recently overturned some of our laws to advances in technology that enable would-be criminals to produce untraceable guns, we in Massachusetts, as does the rest of the United States, face significant challenges. Our communities face challenges that are far from novel. Issues such as suicide, domestic violence, drug-related and organized crime have been with us for some time, <clears throat> but our impacts in our communities remain no less destructive. Lawrence, Massachusetts, I just spoke with the state representative up there today, is dealing with a spike in organized gang activity that's resulting in unprecedented levels of gun violence up there. Yet we also hear from responsible gun owners, from collectors and hunters, that some of the laws in our books are confusing and outright contradictory, that compliance is challenging, especially as neighboring states have completely different approaches, and the federal landscape changes with each new law or judicial holding. And it's in this context that House Speaker Ron Mariano tasked me and my colleagues with taking a comprehensive look at the impacts that guns are having on the lives of residents of Massachusetts to determine how our structure fits within the federal laws and to identify where our policies and resources need to be directed to ensure that the rights and safety of all are guaranteed. So in addition to traditional research, we've embarked on a statewide listening tour. Tonight's discussion is the third stop on this tour. Hunting, sports shooting, and gun collecting are pastimes pursued by many Americans. These activities can offer lessons in responsibility, environmental stewardship, and our shared history. We've heard clearly from many in the gun-owning community that our statutes are complicated and confusing, which makes compliance challenging. We've also heard several times that law-abiding and responsible gun owners feel penalized with myriad requirements that they face. Tonight, our objective is to hear directly from people who own firearms, who use them for hunting and sport, who enjoy collecting them, and are familiar with their history. We've come out to Greenfield to be closer to some of the more rural parts of the Commonwealth, where hunting and outdoor activities are more prevalent. As we've done in Cape Cod and Worcester, our previous two stops, my colleagues and I are here to listen and to learn. We each come to this issue with different views, different perspectives, different experiences. Us being able to share those perspectives with respect and in frank dialogue is essential to our democracy. I recognize that it may ring hollow to hear an elected official say that this is not intended to be a political discussion, but I trust that each of you recognize how interrelated, complex, and challenging the issues we are about to discuss are. My colleagues and I come to tonight's discussion with no set wish list of changes. We know we don't have all the answers and we don't even have all the questions. So we're here to listen and to engage to understand how our statutes impact our residents in every corner of the Commonwealth, and to understand how we can improve those laws for every corner of the Commonwealth. Massachusetts has always distinguished itself as a place where we face our challenges with candor and our disagreements with mutual respect and civility. I trust that tonight will be another example of that. So prior to introducing our panelists, I will start with some civility by providing a few words of thanks. First to our hosts here tonight. President Shutt from Greenfield Community College, welcome. Uh, and thank you very much. Keith Bailey from the President's Office, Dan DeRocher from the Marketing Director, Bjorn Silva and Alexandra Audette who are in charge of setup and securing the facility for us. Thank you very much for your hospitality and welcome us here tonight. Greenfield TV as well for covering this event. Uh, I want to introduce my legislative colleagues here, uh, your delegation from this area. We've got Representative Whips, Representative Saunders, Representative Carey, Representative Blay, and Representative Dome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Representative Sabadosa could not be here, and Senator Comfort, I believe, Comfort is in Amherst preparing for town meeting, I believe, which is where Representative Dome is going to run out to shortly. 
but thank you all for coming. Uh, now to our panelists. First, we've got Chief Michael Mason. Chief Mason began his career as a public safety dispatcher in Hadley in the year 2000. He served the Hadley Police Department with distinction for the past 23 years. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 2009, and in 2015, he was named the chief of Sudbury Police. Chief Mason received a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Westfield State University in 2000, graduated from the Agawam Police Academy in 2003, and is currently pursuing a master's in criminal justice and criminology at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. Chief, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Toby Leary, owner and co-founder of Cape Gunworks. Toby's the president and co-founder with business partner Brendan Bricklin of Cape Gunworks in Hyannis, Massachusetts. He's first introduced to shooting at the age of 12 through the Boy Scouts of America. Although firearms were not welcomed in his household growing up, he was able to participate in target shooting and hunting activities, which turned his hobby into a business. His passion deepened until on his 18th birthday, he walked into the local police station to get his license to carry and immediately saw the need for an indoor public shooting range on Cape Cod, which eventually translated into his current business, where he now helps someone select the right firearm and equipment at Cape Gun Works Pro Shop. Toby and his wife, Justine, live in Hyannis with their three children. Welcome, Toby. And finally, last but certainly not least, John Pajak is here with us. He's been a firearm instructor for over 40 years, previous, previously taught at the University of Massachusetts, which I just picked up. I did not, unfortunately, overlap with Mr. Paycheck there. A retired lieutenant from the Massachusetts Environmental Police, spent 35 years in our National Guard, active and reserve service, and has great experience uh, in hunting and recreational gun use. Yes, Paycheck, sir. thanks Thank very you. much for coming. So we'll start it off um, with Chief Mason, and um, just open it up, Chief, to your thoughts on uh, our current licensing scheme, mm -hmm. uh, your experiences, and, and uh, insight of that, if you could. Sure. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm a little unnerved that you know that much about me. <laughs> um, and uh, the only thing that I'm sure of tonight is uh, two things. Number one, I'm not really sure why you invited me. We have a couple of other chiefs in the audience who know much more about uh, firearms than I do. So if you see me looking out into the audience, they'll be looking for answers. Uh, and secondly, uh, you are correct in that uh, Chapter 140, the, the Massachusetts Firearms Laws, is extraordinarily confusing. Uh, it's very hard to learn, it's very hard to know, um, and it is one of the things, and there are, there are some contradictory things in there. For those, uh, for those folks in the audience who don't, I know there's a lot of, uh, certainly some gun advocates here who know everything I'm about to say, but there's a, some folks here who maybe don't understand the licensing process so well, so I'll just go over it really quickly. Um, just a 20,000 foot view, basically. So in Massachusetts, when you come to get your firearms license, a, an FID card uh, or, uh, or a license to carry, there are several steps that you have to go through. Um, if, you're, if it's your initial, we have to do a photograph, we have to do fingerprints, uh, we have to do a criminal history check, and a criminal history check uh, involves both in-state criminal history as well as out-of-state criminal history. We call it a triple I, which essentially checks um, you know, the entire United States for your criminal history. Uh, there's something called what we call a Q5, which is essentially a suicide uh, prevention check, something that if you've ever threatened suicide uh, and ever landed on a, on a list that, that tracks that, um, that's another, uh, another factor that we look for. If you have a warrant for your arrest, uh, that's also something that we look for. And then there are two kind of confidential, secure uh, email searches that we have to do, that we have to send off for. One of them is for uh, the Department of Mental Health, uh, to see, because one of the, one of the uh, reasons that you can be denied a, a license to carry is if you are what they call a prohibited person in Massachusetts. And one of those reasons is for a committal for mental health reasons. Um, not to be confused with um, a self-committal. Uh, if, if, you, if you choose to uh, get assistance with mental health, that is slightly different, and I found that out the hard way. Um, dealing with the Firearms Records Bureau uh, with someone who wanted a, a license to carry and uh, back in the 70, late 70s and early 80s uh, had um, gone to a mental health facility on her own and was subsequently became a prohibited person and we actually assisted her in getting her license to carry back after getting uh, information from her doctors that she was, she was better. Um, so once all that's done, then we do what's called a, uh, a uh, basically a fingerprint check. We'll take your fingerprints and we send it in to uh, what's called APHIS, which is the Auto Automated Fingerprint ID System, uh, which 
does essentially the same thing and it will run a, a records check on you. So after all that is done, in Mass now we have what's, uh, what they added into the law that the chief has to do an interview with an initial applicant. The interview doesn't have to happen with renewals, but it has to happen with initial. Uh, unfortunately, within the, the confusing uh, Chapter 140 laws, uh, they, no one told us, no one actually explains within the law what that interview needs to consist of. There's no questions, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that we're supposed to be looking for, we're essentially just supposed to be kind of analyzing this person. Now, the good thing is that the reason that local chiefs, and this is in the spirit of what I believe the law was put together for, is that local police chiefs are supposed to know the most about the folks that live in their communities. It makes a little bit more sense than having the you know, commissioner of Boston um, give everyone licenses to carries in, in the entire state. When you have somebody who lives in my community in Hadley and Deerfield or in Conway, um, it's a little bit different that the chief, it's a small community, the chief is, is supposed to know a little bit about you. They can, we can check our systems and see if we've been to your house uh, for any number of reasons. So you have the prohibited person portion of the statute, which gives a list of different reasons which is, uh, of why you cannot get a license to carry. If you've committed a felony, if you've committed a misdemeanor where you could be imprisoned for more than two years, um, if you've had a dishonorable discharge in the military, uh, if you're a fugitive, fugitive from justice, uh, things like that. There's a number of different reasons where you can become a prohibited person. And then Massachusetts also has, and this, this part is, a little bit more discretionary for the local police chief, and it's where that local option kind of comes in or makes a little bit more sense. They have what they call a suitability option or, or suitability reason. And suitability can come into play at any point during your licensing. It can come into play in the beginning when you're applying for the license. It can come into play when you're going for a renewal, or it can come into play if something occurs in between the six years that you have your license to carry, if something happens, if you are intoxicated with a firearm and you do something foolish or uh, something, some type of articulable fact that gives the licensing authority reason to believe that you are likely not a safe person to have a firearm, that's where the suitability issue comes in. And um, while I don't know a lot of chiefs in Western Mass uh, who have used the option too, too often, we do use it. Obviously, things do happen. Um, none of us have a crystal ball, so everybody, somebody could pass every single one of those checks and uh, give us no reason to believe that issuing them an LTC would be a problem. Six months down the road, a year down the road, three years down the road, while they are a responsible gun owner, they could do something foolish and, and require us to suspend their license. So those are the kinds of things that we see in Hadley and I think a little bit in Western Mass. I don't want to speak for all of my counterparts here, but um, that's how we look at things. We do believe that I think the law can be streamlined. Um, I think the process can probably be streamlined. Uh, I think one of my fellow panelists is going to bring up some great ideas that I've actually heard recently. Um, to try to streamline the process a little bit better while still hitting all of those important points to make sure that someone is a safe gun owner. I think I've spoken way too, way longer than you want to, sorry. But that's, that's my bit. I'm, and I'm, I'm here again to really listen as well because um, I think I, I'm currently the president of the Western Mass Chiefs and again, I can't speak for all the chiefs, but I think we'd love to hear some ideas to make things a little bit better. Um, you know, safer if, if, if people think that there's parts that are unsafe and things that we can then advocate for with our, with our um, uh, representatives and senators to try to make changes if, if necessary. So, thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Toby, if you could pick up and, and talk about your experience as a small business owner and um, instructor as well. Sure. And dealer. Right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I've been in business for about nine years now. Uh, it's my second career, if you will. I, I was a woodworker for years and a recreational shooter, hunter, as he said in my bio, but um, I was a passionate gun owner for, since I was 18 years old, I was the guy who walked in on my 18th birthday to the local police department with my certificate and my form filled out, my check for $100, and you know the chief looks at my thing, looks at me and says, oh boy, we got a live one here, folks. And so, uh, you know, 
I was very excited to get my license to carry, and I realized uh, at the time that we're one of the only states in the country that requires a license to exercise your right to keep and bear arms. You cannot even simply purchase a firearm without this license to carry. So this is very exclusive to uh, Massachusetts and, and you know a lot of others. There's a few other states that have a similar licensing scheme, but. Um, so, at the time, at 18 years old, I could actually purchase a handgun, and did, um, and have owned them ever since. So, it's been over, a little over 30 years now. Uh, but what I found very interesting in the process um, was that it took six months for me to get my license to carry. Um, I, I would go down, as I explained, I was already excited to get this done, and so I was going down every couple of weeks, and, hey, did it come in yet? Did it come in yet? And they're like, no, we'll call you. See you later. And so... Uh, after about a month or two, it, it became apparent to me that, number one, they were sick of seeing me. Number two, uh, I think they're trying not to give it to me. So I, I persisted, and after about six months, they finally opened the drawer and pulled it out and said, here you go, kid, don't screw it up. And I said, I won't, you know, but thank you, and went on my merry way. Uh, but it, it showed me something that was very interesting, and that was that, uh, you know, the state law was required to, to give me an issuance or a denial within 40 days. And uh, it strung out to six months. And as a gun store owner, we give the license to carry class probably about four or five times a week. We do, uh, you know, sometimes at the height of even COVID, we were doing it eight to ten times a week. But now we're doing it four to five times a week. And we see people with all different kinds of requirements. Some town, you have to have a live fire certificate. Some towns, you have to give the interview like uh, uh, Chief Mason was just talking about. Some towns, you gotta give a list of references. And, and I know some of this has changed since the Bruin decision came down in June, uh, but uh, it's, it was you know the, kind of the wild, wild west as far as how things are issued, and it wasn't very consistent. And uh, so when I started Cape Gunworks, uh, I'm just gonna open my phone because I put some notes, and I had to write this down because I didn't believe it myself. Um, I actually have 10 different state and local licenses in order to conduct the business that I conduct. It's 10 different government-issued licenses, and those include license to carry, uh, machine gun license, license to sell ammunition, license to perform gunsmithing activities, license to sell firearms, uh, business license, a shooting gallery license, because we have an indoor range, an entertainment license for our streaming music service, uh, an entertainment license for our pool table, an entertainment license for each of the video monitors that we have in the, in the showroom. All of these are hundreds of dollars a, a year to renew, by the way. And, and even though the state law says that they cannot exceed $25, but that's another story for a different day. And uh, also on the federal side, we possess a federal firearms license as a manufacturer of firearms, and uh, we pay a special occupation tax to the federal government for $1,000 a year just to be able to deal in what's known as NFA items. And uh, so this whole process from start to finish took well over a year and a half to get uh, permitted, and the very first application of the permit to the town was denied. They told me I, didn't, I couldn't open a gun store in my town, and uh, I had to hire a lawyer for an additional fee and show them that you know, a, a retail gun shop is the same as the retail sneaker shop and the same as the retail convenience store on the same road in the same town. And uh, it doesn't have to explicitly say that you have a right of the zone for guns. And, uh, you know, so it, it just was an additional roadblock that was laid in front of us. Uh, but we persisted and we opened what would ultimately become one of the state's largest and state-of-the-art retail uh, pro shops and training facility and indoor ranges. So uh, we're very proud to say that we train uh, thousands and thousands of people a year outside of just the requirements that Chief Mason talked about in order to get your license to carry. So once you get to take the four-hour class that the state mandates and you get the certificate, you can go down and uh, apply at your local police department and pay the $100 and get fingerprinted, photographed, and all that gets sent out to the state that he explained. And uh, once you get all that done, uh, you get your license to carry. Now you can buy a gun that you're going to get background checked again when you go in and buy it. So. It's been our experience that uh, I would say, and this might be even uh, a result of the licensing scheme, but as a, we probably get two to five denials a year 
uh, of people who are prohibited people uh, that try to buy a firearm, a lot of times they actually get cleared up because there's some clerical error, so they're false positives a lot of times along the way. But out of the um, two to five, you know, a year that are actually prohibited that we can't do a transfer and sell, there are thousands of cases a year where somebody has been through that whole process, they've been issued their license to carry, and then they come to purchase their firearm, and oh, you forgot your PIN number. And meanwhile, this guy just took a boat over from Nantucket and paid hundreds of dollars in a car, get his car on the boat, and he comes over on a Saturday, and the state's not there to answer the phone on a Saturday to give him his PIN number that was issued with his license to carry. He's already been background checked to, you know, and he's even passed the federal background check in my store, but I still can't lease the firearm to him because he doesn't have his PIN number with him. And they, we can't just call and, and get that PIN number on a, on a weekend. During the week, during business hours, there's a time when they do answer the phone and they're helpful in, in getting that. But all I'm saying is this, this very restrictive gun uh, issuing licensing scheme, in my opinion, is uh, all it's doing really is inconveniencing the people you don't need to worry about. There's, I think, 600,000 gun owners in this state, and the vast majority of them law-abiding, trying to do their best to... Uh, obey the law and follow the rules. Uh, believe me, I get more people calling a week saying, can I have this on my gun? Can I, does this need to be pinned? Does this stock have to be pinned and welded? Does the, is the flash hider okay on this gun? And it's maddening, the minutia and the confusion of it, just so people can try to do the right thing and try to be compliant with the law. All for the people we don't need to be worrying about in the first place. Um, if somebody wants to talk, and I, I host a radio show each week called Rapid Fire Radio, and uh, I beg people to come on the show that have uh, dissenting views or disagree with me, and I will gladly debate and sit down and have a civil debate on meaningful change of what I think could help make our community safer. And I really want to tip my hat to the state for even inviting me up here today because uh, I believe that this is a step in the right direction that we can uh, probably uh, help facilitate and maybe you know guide the direction of making it less uh, restrictive for people who have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms and aren't prohibited people in the first place, and also you know uh, making our community safer. There's some meaningful things that we could do to do that, and so uh, you know I applaud the efforts here today, and I'm happy to answer any questions from anybody as time permits. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Toby. Uh, John. Joe, your insight on uh, your years of experience and... and uh, My God, I where do I start? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll start at the beginning, and the real reason I came in was to speak as a firearms owner, as a recreational slash competitive shooter, and as a hunter. But I have to temper all of that by reminding everyone that my comments, particularly about the hunters, are based on 28 years in the field with the environmental police. And there's a, there's a good handful of people in here that know me um, from being involved with the clubs, being at their ranges, etc. cetera. Um, I guess the word I probably could use would, would, would be offensive. And I, I find it offensive in the media in particular when they try to link and create a nexus between lawful gun owners, sportsmen and women, and people involved with crime guns. Be they ghost guns, stolen guns, obliterated serial numbers, you know, the ever so deadly AR-15, which apparently defies all of the laws of physics in its descriptions for the ammunition. Um, these are law-abiding citizens, particularly in Massachusetts, and I'll, I'll stand with the chief and with, to with Toby, and I have some experience in issuing firearms licenses as well, because when I retired from the environmental police, I worked part-time for two municipal police departments, one of which I'm, I am pretty much it as far as licensing went. Um, so I did the background checks, and I counseled people when they came in and said, what do I need to do? And I sent them to people who taught courses, um, and I also, my standard line is, look, just because you took an initial course, this is a perishable skill. And I have the background as a, as a firearms instructor, law enforcement and military, for decades to say that and, and to back it up with my credentials. And I encourage safety, I encourage training. Um, try to sort through the safe storage laws. 
as Toby said, the minutia about firearms. You know, is it a flash suppressor or a muzzle brake? Um, God forbid someone buys a, a, a barrel to put on an AR-15 and everything is pinned, but it has a bayonet lug. Um, might put the gun out of compliance, and people work through these things. And again, you know, law-abiding citizens. I have not run into any dangerous felons on any range, on any sportsman's club in Massachusetts throughout my entire career. I can tell you because at, at a couple of points in my career, probably better than half of it, I studied the statistics of violators, um, fish and game laws in particular, and we looked at violations and we looked at ways to remediate those violations through education, either modification of the hunter education program or changes in the abstracts. I worked very closely with fish and wildlife. And out of the 60 something thousand people that are out there that have hunting licenses, the, the number was higher. But quite frankly, the, the, the lack of Lack of open space, the cultural changes, and the problems, some of the problems with the firearms laws have moved people away from hunting. Um, but we had about a 3% violator rate. And that's everything. That's not just deer jacking. That's, you know, they didn't have an orange hat in a wildlife management area. They didn't fill out their, their tag properly on their deer. So 3%. And this was consistent for, for two decades. And we would try to address it through various, various means. But these are, these are real violations. So my point is, again, there is no nexus between the, the heroin dealer that's stopped by the Mass State Police on I-91 um, you know, with three stolen guns out of Georgia and a thousand bundles of fentanyl and, a, and a, a couple ounces of heroin with, by the way, three or four pages of priors and a guy or gal at the local shooting club or the guy or gal that buys gets an LTC and buys a handgun for self-protection. Quite honestly, sir, I, I think that as the legislature sometimes, and I read the pending legislation, the proposed legislation, I think that the focus is in the wrong direction. I think that the focus should be on the serious criminal violators, the people who flaunt the laws. There was just a young man arrested in Springfield, um, read it in the news, I think it was this morning, either this morning or last night. It was drug crimes, but the headline was he had a stolen ghost gun from Georgia. Okay, great. Springfield cops did a great job. No doubt about it. And I read the charges. Everything was second offense. My question is, after the first offense, why is he even on a street? That's where the problem is. That's where the shootings are taking place. Um, one of, the, one of the proposed pieces of legislation that I've seen out there is to ban all semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. Hopefully that will never get any legs underneath it because that includes your grandpa's Sweet 16 shotgun. That includes your M1 Garand rifle, the greatest battle implement ever devised, a part of our history, the M1 carbine. About a third of all of the sporting shotguns that are out there on the market now that are popular, that are used for skeet, for trap, for sporting clays, for, uh, for hunting. Okay, and again, based on 40 years in law enforcement, 28 of them dealing face-to-face -face with people in the field. I was never really an admin guy. The, close, the closest thing I came to being an admin guy was being in a hunter education bureau where we actually taught hunter safety education, um, and not only out at the public venues, the schools and the sportsmen's clubs, et cetera, but the junior conservation camp, the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program, and a whole host of other places, that these are not the people that are problematic with firearms. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud to count myself amongst those people that have, have had hunting licenses. My first one was in 1974. I never missed a year. I've had a continuous LTC. I had an FID card at 15. I went through a hunter education course so I could get one. And I think that, uh, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of safety training. I will never say that, oh, you have a civil right, you should just be able to walk into a gun store and, you know, pick up, uh, pick up two sub guns and a, and a law rocket and, because it's your constitutional right and go have a great time with it because safety training is part of being a responsible owner. 
just like securing your firearms. And long before we had the Safe Storage Act in Massachusetts, and I truly mean long before, long before I was walking around, at least from the 1950s, hunter education programs and safety brochures that came out from the firearms manufacturers always said, never store a loaded gun, never mix firearms with alcohol or prescription drugs, store your firearms and ammunition in locked containers separate from each other. Which is what our, our we had to put it into statute because, because of a tragedy of an illegally owned firearm that was acquired by a child and ended up resulting in a death. But I, I go back one more time to say that the lawful licensed gun owners are not part of the problem. I have one more comment regarding this. A week ago, I sat through a seminar at Westfield State College where I also teach part-time in a conservation law enforcement program. The Biden administration's ordered a study on uh, commerce in firearms, gun trafficking, and the use of firearms and crimes. Okay, NFA weapons, machine guns, silencers, short barrel rifles, etc. They don't even show up on the radar. They are not involved with crime guns. In fact, the retired ATF agent who was there said that in his entire career, he remembers one being used in a crime in Miami back during the drug wars. And that was it. Um, his statement, and I have one of my students is in here who can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, his statement was the people that go out of their way to abide by the laws are not the problem. And that study is showing statistical evidence. The first two volumes are published. The third one is ready to go. The fourth one will come out with recommendations. Um, it is showing that there is a certain demographic of people at, that are attracted to certain types of firearms. Semi-automatic 9mm handgun happens to be the one that's involved in a lot of shootings. And along with that is massive non-compliance with any of the gun laws that are out there to include putting sear switches, a.k.a. Glock switches, on these pistols which turn them into machine guns. Which in Massachusetts, having an unlawful machine gun carries up to life imprisonment. A couple of police officers from Connecticut that were up attending that, uh, that present presentation said that they are awash with these things in the cities in Connecticut amongst the drug gangs. In fact, the presenter, again, who was the retired SAC from AT, special agent in charge of ATF in Boston, said there isn't an ATF office in a country that you can't go into where there are mountains of these things that have been turned over by postal inspectors or seized by agencies executing drug warrants. So I, I close with saying again, the law-abiding sportsmen, women, gun owners, for whatever reason you have it, you're a target shooter, you need to protect yourself. Um, you've gone through the steps, you've gone through the training, you have the permits, and even absent the permit, if you meet the requirements on a 4473, which is, if, for the people that don't know, that's the form you fill out when you buy a gun. If you meet those requirements, there should be no question, you are not part of the problem. It's the illegally acquired firearms and people involved in criminal activity already. Thank you, sir. Spajak. No, not at all. Not at all. Appreciate the perspective. Um, before I open it up to, to my colleagues in the audience, though, I want to give the panel opportunity if you wanted to pick up on anything anyone said uh, to step in. If, if I might sure. echo a little bit. Uh, it's John, right? John. What John said about um, the, you know, the ambiguity about this gun or that gun. And I might point out that, like when he said, the, the barrel that got put on the AR-15 with the bayonet lug, that's a felony in this state. It's not like a slap on the wrist, like, hey, don't do that. This is a felony, and that person will become a lifetime prohibited person in Massachusetts, and it's a victimless crime. This is literally a violation of a state statute or law that, that uh, is a, a feature on a gun. It doesn't alter the gun in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't make it shoot any different, faster, quieter, or any of that. It is literally a feature on a gun, and there's a whole minefield of those type of things that, that people can find themselves in. And we're not talking about like, oh yeah, make sure that doesn't happen. We're talking about felonies that make you a prohibited person for life. I, I actually did have one thing as well, uh, something that, that John said. Um, <clears throat> there's a, something, you know, there's a delineation between when he was talking about um, the difference between, you know, uh, individuals with a, with a lengthy criminal record versus your, your average citizen who, who is a responsible gun owner. Um, 
you know, as a police officer for how long I've been a police officer, you know, in, in Hadley and in Western Mass, you know, with the exception of your major cities like Springfield and Pittsfield and places like that, we don't come across illegal firearms very often. Um, but when we do, it's a it's usually an, an interesting situation and it's a dangerous situation. And um, I will echo what John said in that uh, a lot of the folks that we do come across are not, this is not a first time offense situation. And it's, it's, it's confounding to us that, that uh, when we do pick these individuals up and we seize illegal firearms, we seize the firearm, I don't know if you guys can help me with this, but there's, a, there's, only, there's only been two seized in, Massachusetts, uh, in Western Mass as far as I know. One of them was in Springfield, one of them was in Hadley. And it, it's a pistol, but it actually shoots a, a armored, body armor penetrating almost a rifle round. It's probably like there's a couple AR different variations something like that. out there. So frightening, frightening gun. Um, <coughs> And the individual that we arrested, but it had multiple, multiple charges, multiple gun charges, violent felony charges on his record. And it's difficult to deal with stuff like that when you also look at the other side of things. Um, and I was, I was speaking with our reps and uh, senators beforehand. Ken, can you tell me how many years ago was it that um, the, the federal, uh, Massachusetts was forced to comply with the federal regulations when it comes to uh, criminal charges, and we had a whole bunch of people get suspended because they had like OUIs. Uh, was it that long ago? Yeah. There, well, there was something something that occurred. Years, though, that's yeah, that's what I'm referencing. Okay, so right. Okay, so about three years ago, um, Massachusetts was the the Firearms Records Bureau (FRB) was was uh, was essentially told by the the feds that. Um, audited by the ATF and they discovered that the, the federal laws when it comes to certain crimes were not being followed the same way that the, the federal laws suggested. And so what happened was is they forced Massachusetts to comply with what the federal standard was. And so chiefs all over Massachusetts started getting these notification letters um, for people who were, we were told to suspend their licenses to carry. And uh, a lot of it didn't make any sense to us because we were talking about folks who had a drunk driving arrest when they were 21 years old and no other criminal history to speak of, no other issues. And so we're, t we're, we're basically being told to suspend their licenses to carry based upon this. The Massachusetts statute does not say that. So we were all very confused as to how to handle the situation. It got to a point where you, we had, had a particular individual who was a, um, a lifelong paramedic who was 40 some odd years old uh, was arrested for drunk driving when he was 21 years old, had a license to carry since he was, since he was 21, or I think he had an FID before that, uh, and never had any problems, never had any criminal charges, nothing on his record, and all of a sudden, bam, we have to suspend his LTC. Well, I had no other recourse but to tell him to, to take me to court. Uh, and I told him to appeal the decision. And I ended up in front of a judge, and I ended up basically arguing the man's case for him because it didn't make sense to me why these types of things were happening, and yet, on the flip side of things, we're arresting people with multiple felonies, violent felonies, and scary, frightening firearms. Um, I don't necessarily know what, you know, certainly what, our, our, what the state can do to help with situations like that. That's obviously an executive, that's, that's obviously a judicial um, issue, but um, I just wanted to kind of echo what John was saying. From a law enforcement perspective, that is the kind of thing that we're seeing that just doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Great, so I'm going to um, transition now to open it up for public comment. Before I do, um, I want to thank and, and uh, again well, and recognize and welcome our legislative delegation who said, get off Beacon Hill and go out and listen to folks, uh, and, and brought us out here to Greenfield to talk to you all and listen to you all. Um, so I want to give my colleagues, if they'd like, an opportunity to address the crowd, not to put anyone on the spot, but you're certainly more than welcome to, to do so. Otherwise, we'll pivot and uh, open it up to the public. On behalf of the delegation, I'd just like to welcome you, Representative Dave, to Greenfield, and we're happy to have you here, and certainly like to hear from the audience, unless any of my colleagues have anything else. I'm so proud you must be I'm happy to be back. And thank you to the panel. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so we're going to open it up to the, uh, to the audience now. Talia uh, Quinn in my office will have the microphone. Raise your hand, I'll recognize you, and, and off we go. Uh, yep, in the back. The blue hoodie. Are you holding it? 
Thank you so much. This is a great opportunity to be here. My name is Renee Gagne. I'm one of the women from the DC Project. We're a national organization of women that safeguard our Second Amendment. This is the, th the third tour that I've been in attendance of, and I definitely appreciate it, Rep Day, so much. Thank you for this. Panelists, thank you. Chief, I'm sorry that I missed what you said. Um, I just took Chief Glidden's law class. I invite anyone in here who doesn't think Massachusetts has enough laws, 450 pages right here. Um, I'm not quite sure if we add to this that it's going to change anything since our gun violence and crime is up 111 percent since a lot of these laws were enacted. Um, but right now I'm, I'm happy to be here because I like to see the different perspectives in the room and we all come here with different perspectives and I like to hear all of them. Um, we may not agree, but we all want the same things. We want safe communities and we're looking for effective solutions for that. So today with me I have um, my 15-year-old delegate here who wants to share her teenage perspective on a law that she doesn't really think belongs um, lumped into the firearm laws here in Massachusetts. So I'm going to um, not ask my question so she can have a chance to speak if that's okay. My name is Olivia Longton and I'm a 15 year old high school student. I am at the age where my mom lets me go out with my friends without her. My mom carries a gun, but now I don't have her to protect me. I watch the news and see all the crime happening in my area. I want to be able to protect myself with pepper spray. The Massachusetts law reads that I cannot have pepper spray unless I get a firearms identification card. It could take many months for me to get that card issued to me. I want to be my own self-protector now, not months from now. I ask that the legislators fix laws like this to make more sense so girls like me can have protection. Thank you. Sure. Uh, my name is Wayne Dorpels. I'm from South Hadley. Can I help it? Oh, why not I go over here? Okay, cool. I'll go on your right. Um, I'm 68 years old, and I have raised six children, four of my own, and I have six grandchildren. And there's two things that I'd like to point out. I'm a competitive pistol shooter. I went to buy a center fire pistol. It's a Colt 1911 and 38 Super. The only one on the Massachusetts list is stainless steel. No one that is a competitive pistol shooter shoots stainless steel. The blued one that I put money down and paid for, I couldn't get. That to me is asinine. <laughs> Second is I'm going to go to Africa to go hunting. I cannot get ammo in Massachusetts for African hunting. 500 Nitro Express, five, uh, two, 275 Rigby and 375 Holland and Holland. One of the other things that they ask for in Africa is that you bring a, um, I use the word silencer. Uh, I am not going to put a silencer on my rifles. They were both Rigby's. If anyone knows Rigby, they know that would be stupid because they cost a lot of money. <laughs> the last thing I'd like to say is that sometimes we see legislation that's passed that we feel is nothing more than one-upsmanship. And as a father, that kind of gets me angry. In my neighborhood, we have lost John Laro, Scott Grenier, Dave Bernier, Jesse Lasserpel, Greg, Greg Borgard, and uh, Bernie LaFont's grandson, and my own son to heroin. That's 31 houses, that's seven kids dead. If you want to do something about crime, stop that. Just, and that's all I have to say. It, it just, it bothers me no end to see this over and over again about what stupid laws about having this gun you can buy, but that gun you can't, but they've been available for over 100 years. And then kids die in my neighborhood every day. And this is, by the way, within 13 years. 
in my knowledge, in the last 25 years, there's only been three murders in South Hadley, two of them with handguns, one of them with a knife. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am. Hi, my name is Robin Knipe, and I am the local group lead for Moms Demand Action. 44,348 died from guns in 2022. 20,000 and 90 of them were suicides. 20,258 were homicides or accidental shootings. As of April 23rd, 13,031 people have died from gun violence since the first of the year. So to put it another way, 69% of, of the year remaining, 42,000 people will die by the new year if the current trains prevail. So Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, Students Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and Every Town for Gun Safety are grassroots organizations working to reduce deaths by common sense gun legislation. I really appreciate um, the panel today, and I appreciate the speaking tour. We are currently supporting and working to ask for mass legislation laws, and I'd just like to mention them quickly. I won't put the numbers on, but I just want to say what they're relative to. One of them is relative to firearm industry accountability and gun violence victims' access to justice. The other is to legislate the combat rising threat of ghost guns. We know there was an executive order signed, but we also know that that's in court, and Massachusetts does have wonderful gun laws, and we do want to continue to lead the nation. There's also an act relative to crime data and reporting and analysis, which will probably help with some of the changes that you think need to happen. And then an act requiring live fire practice for a firearms license of five hours. Um, the other two bills th that we're supporting are an act relative to using Medicaid for violence prevention and intervention and a trust fund um, add-on to that um, to make that possible to happen. And the last one is to provide an act to promote safe firearms storage and education to increase the well-being of students. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, in the back. And then we'll come to the gentleman there. Hi. My name is Bill Beda. I have two wonderful grandsons out in Arizona. I'd like to be able to transfer two shotguns to them when they turn 21. I'd like to know how to do it. Very hard. <clears throat> I'd like to do it legally. Um, I've been to several gun establishments in Western Massachusetts and have not received a good answer on how to do this legally. Arizona does not require any firearms ID card whatsoever. So on the panel up there, does anybody have an idea? Thank you. you can ship them directly there's no law that says you can't ship them directly but some gun dealers don't allow uh, private individuals to ship to gun stores so you might have to go through a dealer so you got to know the dealer that you're shipping to to make sure they'll receive it directly from you but if they won't go to a local gun store ask them to pack it up ship it they'll send it to the local gun dealer in Arizona and then when your grandkids go to pick them up or whoever's picking them up for them uh, they they will do a what's known as a uh, 4473 and they'll transfer them to them. So it's, there'll be a small fee involved. Okay. <clears throat> that I know. I want to know how do I legally take these shotguns out of my name and transfer them to them? Yeah. It, once, once that FFL receives the guns, they log them into their what's known as a bound book. It's a federal book that's uh, you know, audited by the ATF. So it'll, there'll be a record that those guns went to that gun store and it'll be logged into their bound book and then they will transfer them. So there's really nothing else you need to do. Um, if they were in state, there is a process you can do that 
you know, person to person transfer that will transfer one to the other. But if you're shipping it out of state, there's really uh, nothing you need to do. Most states don't have gun registration. Uh, Massachusetts does, but uh, in Arizona they do not. So you can certainly just ship it to them. Once it's logged in the FFL's book, it's legally been transferred to the to those who pick them up. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, sure. Mark John Felice, Agawam, Mass. I got a question at work is, how many times can you hit yourself in the thumb with a hammer before you figure out you don't know how to use a hammer? We know there's no such thing as gun violence. We know there's violence with a gun. We know they're violent people. It doesn't matter what weapon they have. We know most of the mass murders, the big ones, didn't even involve guns. Happy Land Nightclub, 83 people killed fire. Coconut Grove, negligent homicide, 400 people. You go to Asia, they're stabbing people in the subways 100 at a time because there's no noise. You go to South America, they're killing the police to get their guns. So why aren't we going after the violent people? Why aren't we willing to go out there, throw people in, lock people up, 60, 90 days, get them cleaned up, get them off the drugs, instead of leaving them on the street? You know, I've dealt with people who are psychotic my entire career. I've dealt with drug addicts my entire career. And nobody wants to do anything about them. So why isn't the Massachusetts General Court going after the violent people? Why, don't you, why do you have things like Moms Demand Action telling you to do something instead of people going into the schools and providing mentoring programs, helping people understand what they need, to, why they need to graduate, and what they can do afterwards. Because if you don't know what you want to do or how to do it, it's next to impossible. You know, if you want to be a police officer and you don't know how to be a police officer, it's next to impossible. If you want to go to college and you don't know what you need to do to get into college, it's next to impossible. You know, if you want to be a carpenter and you don't have people who are going to help you how to be a carpenter, it's next to impossible. You know, if you want to start a small business, well, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble with the IRS, but you can go to the community college and take small, or starting a small business in business law, and you're a lot better off. We have violent people out there, but we don't want to deal with them. We have broken families. We don't want to deal with them. We look at the mass shootings. Almost every one of them, they were known to the law enforcement. Sandy Hook. All right, custodial mother did not want the child to go in for testing for autism. Father was agreeing to it. He wasn't a custodial parent. He didn't do anything. Simon Rock, the administrator, was afraid of the person. Went to a friend's house, didn't call the police, didn't call security, just took off. You know, over and over again, I have dealt with people who've just failed to take action. They're in a position of responsibility and they're not taking action. And as you start looking through all of these cases, very few are copycat. Almost every one of them has been known to, the, to somebody and they didn't take action. So why isn't the general court going after violent people? Thank you. Okay, well, my name is Brian Bordner, and I'm from Northfield. And I'm a firearms component manufacturer, amongst other things. That's just a portion of my business. And the significance of me being, us being here tonight, is that we're in the Connecticut River Valley. And this was the birthplace of firearms. All the way from the Windsor Armory up in Windsor, Vermont, all the way down to the Connecticut coast, this is where our nation's firearms were born. This is where they were created. This is what gave us the ability to gain our freedom. The ability, the freedom, 
to have a conversation like this, not to get laws that just take away our possessions, but we can actually come in and we can debate and be adults and rationalize about them. So I'd like to talk about, first of all, as a manufacturer. My facility is 300 yards from the New Hampshire border. My brother owns the facility across the border, bigger than mine. I have saw legislation to ban the manufacture of certain firearm components, which I make. What do you think is going to happen? Real simple. I'm just going to move it up to my brother's facility. Okay? I appreciate the laws in the state of Massachusetts. I really do. And actually, you're better off to hold a federal, uh, to hold a license to carry in Massachusetts than you are in New Hampshire. I can take my LTC, drive up the street from my house 300 yards, and there's no restrictions in me driving my pistol into the state of New Hampshire. But if I lived in New Hampshire and I wanted to bring my pistol down the street, I would have to go on a yearly basis to Boston for an interview to get my permission to get to carry a pistol in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is not that bad of a place to actually be a firearm owner. Do I agree with all their laws? No. Do I think they're effective? Most. Um, I have a federal firearms license. I have to fill out 4473s. Uh, the gentleman who has the firearm shop. I was a provision shop when I was seven years old. Gotcha. Um, I got to tell you, this is where New York versus Bruin changed the atmosphere. The ruling in New York versus Bruin gave us our rights far beyond the Revolutionary War. They gave us our rights back to the inception of basically the Magna Carta. If you're a person, you have the right to defend yourself. So now we are defending ourselves from proposed laws. Now, I, I got the Greenfield Recorder here, and it said about three laws that are being proposed. One is um, that they're going to put a 36% tax on all guns and ammunitions, and the money's going to go to low income communities in a gun buyback program. First of all, you can't buy back all the guns and pay for the property at face value. Massachusetts does not have the money and never will. Second of all, they're just going to go to New Hampshire to buy their ammunition. There's no restriction. Okay, the only thing they can't do is buy a handgun. So they can go, Massachusetts residents can go to New Hampshire, buy a rifle, and not pay the 36% tax. So it's self-defeating and it's driving income out of our state, okay? Second one, there's gonna be um, a proposed bill that make gun owners civilly liable for crimes committed with their lost or stolen weapons. Think about that for a minute. So if someone steals my car and they run over somebody, I'm criminally liable? That's not gonna pass. That's gonna be defeated, even if it passes Massachusetts. It's not gonna be defeated. Banning semi-automatic weapons. Massachusetts in a gun buyback program would force, be forced to pay the value of those firearms. You don't have enough money and you never will because you know how many firearms are out there. But I want to bring it back to the law. The law is now from the Supreme Court, New York versus Bruin. We have an innate right to protect ourselves. That being said, on February 24th, 1803, there was a Supreme Court ruling that said, it was called Marbury versus Madison, declared it was the first act of the Congress, who's the body governed to make our laws, makes a unconstitutional law. Thus, it went under judicial review 
And to, to quote exactly, that a, law, that a law that is repugnant to the Constitution is void, and the courts as well and other departments are bound by that instrument. So instead of making laws or proposing laws that just aggravate the, the, the residents of Massachusetts, I go back to this gentleman over here. Why don't you make some laws that are dealing with what's really hurting us, what's really killing us? This last week, April 28th, hundreds of pounds were seized crossing the border. Fentanyl, heroin, cocaine. These are where we need our laws. Those are the drugs that are driving the mental instability of the people in this country to turn around and feel that they have such an insignificant regard for human life Amen. that they can kill someone. So I'm speaking as a victim. I'm speaking as a, a manufacturer of firearms. I'm speaking as a person who lives under these laws from the Constitution and protects my rights. And I'm also speaking as a victim of a violent crime. Okay, I was almost murdered. Do you think, law or no law, that I'm going to be giving up my right to protect myself, to, to retain my semi-automatic weapons? It's not going to happen. The only thing it's going to do is drive a further wedge between these people who are trying to do some good and the population. Thank you. Hello, uh, hi there. My name is Kang Lu. I'm uh, from Keene, New Hampshire, um, Cheshire County. I wanted to speak to the previous speakers uh, in regard to coming down from New Hampshire with arms. Um, and it goes to the very critical definition of the license itself, okay? When you come down from New Hampshire to Massachusetts, your license in New Hampshire, should you have one, no longer applies. And the reason for that is because the license, according to our laws, is a professional license. Now, let me read you three segments of the laws. The chief will know that in order to get a license to carry, you must have a background check. 803 CMR 2.01 says, for the purpose of evaluating applicants for employment, volunteer opportunities, or professional licensing, that's what the background check is for. It doesn't say you have, a, you have to get a background check to, uh, to exercise your right under the Constitution. It says here also, if you want to get a gun license, you need to have your fingers printed. MGL 6, 172B.5 says the licensing requirement to submit fingerprints may be imposed and it requires, quote, applicants for licenses in specified occupations to submit a full set of fingerprints. Number three, you all know that you have to pay $100 to get a license. And who do you say, submit that to? The licensing authority. Now, I challenge you to go into MGL 140, 120, and, uh, one, uh, and 131 and look for the licensing authority. The licensing authority licenses occupations of gunsmiths and retail gun sellers. And here's where it says that. The licensing authority is defined at MGL 6, 172N as one, quote, with the authority to impose occupational fees for licensing excuse me, or licensing requirements on a profession. There, there is our problem, is the, under, the misunderstanding of our laws. Our laws are perfect. The licensing scheme under Chardine versus Boston, chief of police, is, quote, generally the preservation of public health, safety, and welfare by extending to the public trust with those with no proven qualifications that's the Mass Supreme Judicial Court. Meaning, the license gives you an entitlement on top of the rights we already have. It does not detract from the rights that we have. For example, a doctor in New Hampshire crossing the border in Massachusetts 
automatically cannot practice medicine because he's not contracted with the state of Massachusetts. Just as the same way that someone who is licensed in a different state coming across the border, there's no reciprocity. The license to carry is much like a childcare license. If you want to take care of children, you better get a license to, to uh, take care of children. It's two and a half years if you don't have that license because the people demand that those who take care of our children get a background check, get their finger printed, and be vetted for a good person that they ought to be. But there is no license to take care of your own children. It's called parenting. Ain't that right? There's a license to process meat and poultry. It's called a meat and poultry license. If you don't have that, you're processing meat and poultry and selling it in the grocery store, you're violating the law. But when was the last time you, uh, you, their housewife got prosecuted because she went into the backyard and, and, and got a chicken and, and made it for dinner? It doesn't happen. My point is, my point is these laws are um, misinterpreted, okay? Uh, if you look at, for example, Miranda versus Arizona, where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which can abrogate them. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, a state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right guaranteed by the federal Constitution. A person may not be, cannot be compelled to purchase through a license or a, or a fee or a license tax the privilege freely granted by the Constitution. West Virginia State Board versus, uh, uh, versus Barnett, 1943, the Supreme Court says, the very purpose of our Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be subject to a vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. So what the legislators are doing, they are creating fake laws. And if you read the Declaration of Independence, it says they have subjected us to an unwarrantable jurisdiction, and they are making acts of pretended legislation to, tr to, to, to prosecute us for pretended crimes. And these are the things that are going on. That, this is the real deal. There is no such thing as a license to bear arms. Would you agree? Doesn't exist. Never heard of one. So what does the word carry mean? License to carry doesn't mean you can walk around with a gun on your hip. License to carry means you have been extended an entitlement to serve the public. For example, Mass General Laws 147, Section 8A, it says, sheriffs and deputies, they can carry firearms in the performance of duties. Police officers, Chapter 41, Section 98 says, police officers have the duty and power to carry firearms. To what? To serve us. So going back to the question that the, the young lady had back there, she doesn't need to wait six months in order to get a license to protect herself. She merely needs to defend herself according to the constitutional rights, which is uh, permanent to her and, and, and secured by our constitution. Those licensing requirements are for the officers and for those persons whom we, the public, have delegated to serve us, not the other way around. Article 5 of our Constitution says, all power originally residing in the people, the several magistrates and officers of government are our substitutes and agents. They are at all times accountable to us, not the other way around. Article 7 says, laws are to be written for the benefit of the people, not to impair us. Therefore, I submit, Your Honor, that the license to carry is an entitlement beyond and above uh, the rights that we already have. It's completely irrelevant to us. We should just simply bear arms. Bear arms, that's it. Do not carry a firearm. Those are two different things. And, and Representative Day, I'm sure, would be able to, to explain that. Thank you very much.
Is there a woman on the side over there? Hi, my name is Karen Ann Auclair. I am the state director for Massachusetts. I'm also the state director for Arm Women of America, which is a woman's shooting chapter. I am a female firearm instructor, and I truly believe that education is the key to safety. Um, I'm here tonight. I've been actually, this is a third tour, tour that we've been, um, had the privilege to join. And thank you so much for everybody, the panel, and Michael Day for doing this. I just wanted to talk briefly about hunting. First, I actually want to talk about something else. To have a firearm, there's many reasons why, right? Hunting, self-protection, recreation, competition, and collection. And each one of those have a special meaning to me, and this is why I do what I do. Hunting is extremely important, and if you don't know why, let me tell you the reasons. Hunting supports conservation efforts. Hunting is also a good source of nutrition, Hunting contributes to the wildlife population management. Hunting stimulates the economy. Hunting helps prevent the spread of disease. And unfortunately, it seems as though, let me just turn my page over, that the fees that, are, that we have to pay to have the hunting license and a license to carry is quite a burden on families. And in my opinion, in all reality, I think that money that we have to pay should be put back into education to provide to individuals that decide to get a license to carry or a hunting license. I also don't understand really the reasons why I can't carry a firearm when I'm ATVing across the street with my family, when I know that there are coyotes and other things I don't hunt. But I would like to be able to have a firearm on my hip to protect my family when I do go ATVing, which I don't understand why I can't. There's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of laws on here that I don't understand. And as Renee already explained to you, I, I would like you guys to really take a look at this because I can guarantee you right now, it's very, very hard to understand. And because of these laws, sometimes you think you understand a law and then all of a sudden, you become a felon because you did something that was just wrong. So here, I'm sure, where I don't know how close we are to New Hampshire, but I am, of course, I'm not carrying. But if I was carrying and I happened to go across the borders because I got lost, then now I'm illegal, right? If I went across the border to a state that doesn't, that's not a constitutional carry state. New Hampshire is, thankfully. So there's a lot of reasons to why I have a firearm, but I'm here to tell you right now, we are not the bad guys. And I think right now, which makes me very sad because I, I too want a safe community. I want to be safe. I want my children to be safe. And that's why I think that education is extremely important. And to be educated means to take a moment to listen to both sides. So that's why I think this is extremely important to have these tours so you are listening to people that are experts like us, like the people that are on the panel tonight. So um, thank you so very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Patrice Sardo. Um, thank you so much, Representative Day, for creating this opportunity. I really appreciate what the panelists had to say. Um, and listening to all of you has been quite an education for me. I have no experience of guns. I've never owned a gun. I've never been fascinated by a gun. I've never, been, I've never wanted a gun. I've never felt compelled to own a gun. I've had a lot of fearful experiences, but it's never, ever occurred to me that that would be a solution for me. <clears throat> I'm very nervous right now. Um, um, the thing that brings me here is um, guns are now the number one cause of death of children. And that really upsets me. And my, um, the volunteer work that I do is to do whatever I can to make sure that that changes in this country. And my way of, uh, right now, of approaching that is I'm a Be Smart volunteer, and so I go into schools and uh, remind folks, uh, first of all, my, my first goal is to get gun owners and non-gun owners to speak to each other um, and get out of the politiz politicization, sorry, I can't even say the word, um, that has torn us apart. 
And listening to all of you, there are so many incredible, responsible gun owners here in this room. And what I keep thinking about is, uh, so everything that I've read about why there isn't federal legislation um, so that all the states are operating under the same laws is because of the politicians in Washington who are preventing good gun laws that would keep everybody safe across the nation uh, safe. Um, and, but that responsible gun owners like yourselves, many of you who are in here in this room, um, want responsible gun laws that are going to protect children. And so what I, the question I have for all of you is how many of you are lending your voices to this issue right now that is before us where guns are the number one cause of death of children? How many of you are speaking up on behalf of children who are going to, go to, who are going to school and being traumatized by lockdown drills because guns are ever present in school for them? It may be not actually, but um, it's uh, the possibility of that happening. There's no place in the country right now where that possibility could not occur. So I would just like to invite all of you responsible gun owners to please lend your voice to this issue. So I, I, you sound so passionate about your being able to own guns, use guns. I personally don't understand it, but I, I respect your right to have those um, under the laws as they currently exist. But I would really love to invite all of you to use your voices to do whatever needs to happen in this country to make sure that children are safe, not only at home uh, from unsecured guns, but also in school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, John, you wanted to offer a comment? A couple of things I'd like to jump on. First off, we. We talked about uh, hunting. I was in the back of the room. I apologize. I had a Charlie horse on my leg. I figured it would be inappropriate to be up here screaming while I'm writhing in pain. Um, so I took a quick walk. Water with some uh, ibuprofen maybe would work. Um, as, far as, as far as the hunting goes, another point I think that, that we need to make is the sale of, of firearms, ammunition, etc. Okay, there is a, a built-in 14% tax on that. Pittman-Robertson tax. So everything that's sold is collected and it goes to the uh, U.S. Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. It's, re it's redistributed to the states based upon license sales. In other words, the more, num the more hunters you get, they, they've got a formula that they use. How much, how much money came from your state? How many licenses do you have? And they give it back to you for specific purposes. Okay, for those of you that are non-gun people and, and the rest of us, all these wildlife management areas that we have and land that is open for recreation 365 days a year, not only including the hunting season, that was paid for partly by that Pittman-Robertson money. The other part of it is, back in the 1980s, the sportsmen and women imposed upon themselves a $5 land stamp tax. For, it goes with every license when you buy a license. And that money goes into a fund with the Inland Fish and Game Fund. It is specifically for purchase of habitat. Okay, and again, now if you want to really delve into this, go to a Fisheries and Wildlife Board meeting because they represent not only the game species but also the endangered species, the farmers, etc. cetera. Um, and this property is put into management, saved from development, and it's all prime property. It's farmland, it's waterways, it's river access. I worked with Fish and Wildlife identifying these pieces and, and touring some of it. So that's, a, that's an in-kind contribution that a lot of people don't, you know, you, you don't see. If you're not a gun owner, if you're not in the game and you don't have that knowledge, you don't realize that all these places where people are riding the mountain bikes and walking their dogs and doing all kinds of cool stuff and going bird watching, that was paid for by people that are buying guns. Now, a portion of that money also comes back and it funds the hunter education program, which at one time, at one time, the schools, the high schools, because you could start, you could take a hunter education course at 14 and get a hunting license at 15. The natural resource officers came into the schools and taught a hunter education class. 
When I went to high school, there was a present list, not an absence list, on the first day of the deer hunting season. There were roughly 600 students in my school. They gave a list of those present instead. And a lot of substitute teachers worked that day. We did not have gun crimes in those days. Hunter education and respect was taught. And quite frankly, a gun hanging in a rack in a parking lot. I know, anybody that's on Facebook, you see all the memes? Okay, I'll tell you a quick story. I brought an M1 carbine into school for Spanish class to give a demonstrative speech. A carbine, magazines, ammunition, stripper clips, the whole nine yards. Walked in the office, talked to the secretary, put it in the safe until the class, walked down, got it, went up, did my speech, went to put it back, walked in, the assistant principal looks at me and goes, what do you got there? I says, an M1 carbine. He says, damn things, I hated him. I, I liked my 03 Springfield. He marched ashore at Anzio. As we were having a discussion, he was examining my carbine. The principal walked in and says, oh, a carbine. Vice principal says, I liked my 03 Springfield, but I, I carried a Garand for a while, too. The two of us got called into the office, and the principal showed me his marksmanship awards with an M1 carbine from the 1950s. And then a guidance counselor came in and says, ah, you guys are ground pounders. He flew a, he flew a P-51 on D-Day. He liked his 50 caliber machine guns. The point is, there was a whole different perspective on guns now, including in the schools. I, I, I don't know anybody for all the time I was in junior high school and high school that would even consider shooting up a school or doing something bad to somebody with a firearm. And in the beginning of my career, I taught hunter education classes in schools at the request of the school departments. And suddenly in the 90s, everybody went crazy about gun, 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 gun. You can't even say the word, we'll, we'll suspend you from school, we'll throw you out, we'll take away your birthday, you know, we'll stamp your, your, your meal tickets, no dessert when you come through the cafeteria if you say gun. I think we lost something there. But I, I, I addressed a whole bunch of issues here, I kind of bounced around with them. But the, the people that are buying hunting licenses, the people who are buying firearms, and the people who are buying ammunition are actually funding safety training programs. They're free. I suggest to any of you ladies here, if you don't have knowledge of firearms, take a hunter education course. Because it's not only about guns. It's about firearms, it's about safety, it's about ethics, and it's about conservation. There's way more to it. It's not just a gun school. If you want to learn how to shoot, come find one of us that's a firearms instructor. We'll teach it to you soup to nuts as a fine group of, group of ladies in their hack with t-shirts back there. They're more than happy to help educate you. Because when you make decisions, you need to be educated to make a decision. You need to be educated. Have some familiarity, have some education, and then make the decision. decision to, do what? to do anything. To be pro, to be anti. I think you should know that, no, I think my, my point is that if you're educated and you know what children are being taught, early teenagers, the right way to do things. Do you know what early teenagers are being taught? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Across the country? No, I know what they were doing in Massachusetts, and I also know how we respond to uh, armed intruders in the schools, because I just finished as a working police officer at the, the end of last year. I'm very well acquainted with it. Uh, there was a gentleman there that's been waiting for a little bit in the zip up. Yep. All right, Greg Perotti from Gill. Plain and simple question. Do you honestly think pushing more laws through are going to stop the criminals? Simple question, yes or no? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Not really a simple question, to be honest. Let's be real about this, right? This is why yes we're having no. to discuss what's going on in the, in the framework of our laws, not only dealing with firearms, but with the bigger issues that we've talked about, mental health, drugs. It's a complex issue. And so to ask for a yes or no question, I think is not a legitimate question. As far as firearms go? As pushing far as more, issue that pushing more laws with. through against firearm owners, saying that it's going to stop crime, do you believe that? Again, that's not a question that you can answer. Talk about what laws, talk about what we're doing, that's what we're doing here, is trying to figure out what makes sense, what doesn't, what's on the books, what should be on the books, what should be off the books. As was pointed out, there are 20,000 laws on the books and criminals still don't follow them. 
By nature, that's right. Criminals don't follow laws. This is not a hearing on proposed laws, though. This is actually a sensing session, and, and, and the legislature truly wants to, in my opinion, because I wouldn't have signed up for this if I thought it was a, a smoke and mirror show, um, that they want to know what the issues really are and what the solutions are. And we know that, we know right off the bat that recidivist crime and drugs are a problem. We identified that. We don't, we have not come to, I don't think anybody here's even proposed any new gun laws to change this. We need to reduce violence, handle recidivist crime, protect the kids in the schools. That's where, we're, that's where we are right now. And lock away violent felons. And lock up violent felons. We're going to move along so everyone can have a chance to speak. We'll go here and then we'll work our way around. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Day. My name is Vicki Zakarowitz. I'm the Berkshire County uh, Moms Demand Action Lead. Uh, I want to thank the panel very much for showing up today. I really appreciate your um, emphasis on gun safety, which is really what Moms Demand Action is about. So I really appreciate you coming here today. And uh, also to the crowd, I really appreciate everybody sharing their experiences uh, with guns. And I have such respect for, for hunters and uh, responsible gun owners. So thank you so much. Um, as we have seen repeatedly across our country, horrific acts of violence against children have been carried out by those who are not authorized to handle firearms. The incident at Sandy Hook Elementary School may not have happened if the mother of the shooter had properly locked and stored her firearms. On behalf of Moms Demand Action, I would like to publicly support Senator Lewis's bill, S-305, and act to promote safe firearm storage education and increase the well-being of students. This bill directs the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to educate families about how to securely store their firearms, the risk of child access to firearms, to provide suicide prevention materials, and to provide information annually in English and in Spanish. In the Berkshires, the common sense <coughs> approach has been well received by parents and educators. It protects our loved ones without any infringement on Second Amendment rights. Thank you so much. Better enough. Hi there, I'm Brian Case from Northampton, Mass. And I have a question for the panel, but namely for Chief Mason. Um, do you believe that uh, civilians should be allowed to possess high-capacity magazines and assault weapons given that off-duty and retired law enforcement are permitted to do so? If yes, please explain. Is there the last part of that again? Um, that, um, basically, should civilians be permitted to have high-cap magazines and assault weapons given that off-duty and retired law enforcement are allowed to in the Commonwealth? Okay, yeah. Um. I mean, I can't speak for all chiefs and I can't speak for Western Mass, I can speak for myself personally. Um, because of the fact that high capacity magazines are legal if they are stamped before a certain year uh, and allow so many people to actually have those magazines, um, so long as all of the other requirements are met, I'm really not concerned about it. But that's, like I said, speaking for Hadley. To clarify? To clarify, this would be um, post-ban mags. What's the difference? It's a stamp. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there that own stamped magazines. And what's the exact date? Something. September 13th, 1994. September 13th, 1994. <laughs> so a lot of magazines. There's magazines out there. There's literally probably hundreds of thousands of them that are stamped, if not millions, that are stamped before a certain date. Massachusetts laws do not prevent anyone from legally owning those magazines. They are high capacity magazines, they are the exact same. The difference is, is there's not a stamp on it that has a date. Um, so to me, it's another one of those confusing, conflicting issues within the law because, I mean, they're everywhere. I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, I believe that, uh, if I could boil it right down, that all gun control is an infringement on our constitutionally protected and enumerated rights. Um, 
what's changed in the last 50 years? Because for the first 200 years, we didn't have gun laws. In fact, I'll go way back to the Revolutionary War. Those were all ghost guns. They were homemade firearms without serial numbers, without the government knowledge of them being created. And they were used in defense of and creation of our country. And we've got so far off the, off the road map here that we're trying to talk about an inanimate object and saying this is to blame. When no, like 50 years ago, I could order a gun through the mail in the Sears Roebuck catalog and, and it could come to my house through JCPenney or the Boys Life magazine. I could go to the five and dime store and pull one out of the barrel and stick it on the counter as I'm walking out the door with my other items that I'm buying for five bucks because it was a mill syrup that was brought back from the war. Nowadays, all those things are destroyed and they're not allowed to be imported back into the country. And the gun hasn't changed. The gun is the same thing that's been around forever, including high capacity semi-automatic weapons that have been around for over a hundred years. So all all gun control, which I believe the government doesn't have, as the gentleman from New Hampshire very articulately expressed, I was actually had in my notes about Murdoch v. Pennsylvania, 1943, which says that for the enjoyment of a constitutionally protected right, the government has zero authority, cannot charge a fee, cannot sell a permit, cannot sell a license for the enjoyment of, I just would ask everyone here, if, if all of those who spoke, and anyone who spoke in the, in the audience tonight, if you had to, four or five months ago, go take a class that your state mandated you take, and they would tell you in this class what you can and can't say, and where you can and can't say it, and they would charge you a fee for that class, and they would give you a certificate, and then you could bring that certificate to your local PD, pay the licensing authority another check for $100, and say, yeah, I want to speak at Greenfield Community College in a few months, so I'm here to apply for my First Amendment right to speak. And they said, okay, no problem. We're going to fingerprint you, photograph you. We're going to subject you to all the background checks Chief Mason just talked about. And then in three or four months, we'll let you know when you get your license in the mail or when you get it back, we'll give you a call. And then right before you go to speak at the Greenfield College, you've got to go through another background check. Oh, and don't forget to show the guy the PIN number when you walk in the door because you won't be able to speak if you don't have your PIN number. We'd all be going, this is insanity. But that is life in the gun owner's world for the last 50 years, depending on what state you live in. It's different for every state. But that is largely the, the life, a day in the life of a gun owner who's trying to do the right thing, trying not to break the law, trying to make sure his gun is compliant, see which gun he can and can't buy, and only to be have roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And all at the same time, having to deflect and defend my right to keep and bear arms every time there's a national tragedy with someone who hasn't been dealt with in society correctly, whether it be a violent career criminal or, or somebody who's mentally insane. And meanwhile, the blame has been put back on the fact that I want to own guns to protect my family and provide for my family. And, and uh, you know, so that's what we're up against as far as the Second Amendment community is concerned. And uh, so yes, I do see all gun control. And, and honestly, it's mostly a victimless crime. There's a guy, uh, Mejia, down in Florida who attached a buttstock to his pistol and he is serving a 21 month sentence in jail, uh, federal penitentiary by the way, for attaching a buttstock to a pistol and made an illegal uh, short barreled rifle. No crime was committed, it was in his house, it, he had a backyard range and he used to shoot it out there and uh, the FBI did a sting operation and used a lot of government dollars to put this guy in jail and he was an, a police dispatcher who had no criminal record, now he's doing 21 months. To clarify it, that was a tax offense. Well, that wasn't a gun it was. offense, it was a tax offense, but, technically. He but, didn't pay the tax fee on it. Correct. Yeah, and the FBI ran a sting operation on him for uh, the anti-terrorism unit. <laughs> so no one was harmed, but yet he's going to do 21 months. Sorry. That was a pretty good rant, Paul. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Had to get off. I like Hi, it. thank you. Um, my name's Julie. A few people know me. I used to be a runner at Douglas Auctioneers, doing the gun auctions there quite a bit. Um, been shooting since literally I was five because, well, frankly, we had land. We could. And because we had antiques, we had inherited from family members, and I needed to know how they worked. It was important. And because, yeah, we occasionally had bears. Like I said, we had land. 
But one of the things that I see the most of, and wow, there's an echo. If we could, thanks. There, look, no echo. Wow. Um, one of the things that I saw the most this evening, obviously a lot of passion, a lot of interest, but I really appreciate that we're here talking about Massachusetts laws and what's happening in Massachusetts. There's a lot happening all over the country. It's very clear as to why laws are different in every single state. And the points made about the lack of reciprocity in Massachusetts, the lack of, um, I had a case I dealt with re recently where the person was facing charges of Massachusetts because they were a long haul trucker out of Virginia whose legally owned firearm that was with them in their sleeper cab of their truck caused them to be jailed in Massachusetts because it, ha it had the ability to hold two bullets more than you were legally allowed to have in Massachusetts and it got attached to the scary label of large capacity. You say large capacity, I think Tommy Gunn from the 20s or, any, or one of those you know, drum kind of feeders. I don't think of the fact we're talking 12 bullets versus 10 in a gun that's designed for it. And those kind of nuances and those kind of differences. And when you look at what Massachusetts is doing and you hear numbers like 60% of this and number one, this for children. Well, we don't know what children is. We don't know what else is going on. We don't know where those numbers are coming from. And the point becomes ending the lies because when you're throwing out numbers with no reference, and you're trying to talk about Massachusetts and what's going on in Massachusetts, and you've got numbers that are easy to reference. A 400 page book that is just one chapter section of laws and you can quote laws, you can quote references, and you can give that background data. But it's so much easier to throw out scary numbers and scare tactics, and you look at the things that are available, and you look at the actions that are out there. An example being House Bill 2527 was the only bill for ghost guns that was favorably commented on by the Committee for Public Safety, but it was never brought up for a vote. So looking specifics at specific votes, specific things, research being done, where the tax money is going, why there's additional tax money is being added on. I mean, this does become a classism problem because only people who have the money can afford all these licenses, all these fees, all these taxes, all these ammo. And how is that fair? And you look at things like the data that is available when you actually talk about Massachusetts numbers, doesn't differentiate between numbers for lawful gun ownership and criminal. And so you look at the fact that we've had certain gun control laws in effect since 1998, and yet there's been a still in that time, and again, I'm referencing Massachusetts, a specific time frame when I'm giving out a number such as 111% increase that's within the state, within the time frame, within the existing laws showing they're still not helping, but we're also not getting the ability to differentiate between what's behind those numbers that's driven from lawful use versus unlawful use, and what are the coexisting factors, such as mental health. Somebody recently mentioned Connecticut and Sandy Hook, yet someone else came up with the fact that what was behind all of that was a mental health issue and a differentiation of parenting choices and a child being harmed for not getting the mental help they needed. That's what was actually behind it, but that doesn't sell commercials, that doesn't give a scare tactic, that's not a scary number, it's easier to say things like ghost. And what I really wanna see more of is an ability to have cross-reference, ability to look at, when these things are discussed, don't just go by the buzz terms. Give us things that we can actually reference and see where the numbers are and see what's come from Massachusetts facts paired to Massachusetts law. Thank you. Good job, Julie.
Gotcha. Good evening. My name is Steve Larravee. I'm from Fitchburg. I'm prior military, retired law enforcement, founding member of NIMLEC Special Operations Unit back in the 80s. So I've pretty much grown up around guns. I am an avid fan of training and firearm safety. I'm also an avid fan of putting blame where it belongs. Gentleman over there talked about 36% tax on firearms and ammunition. That's a gun, a gun grab. You can't take our guns away from us, so you're gonna make it where we can't afford to have them. Okay. A government that tries to take the means of self-defense away from its people is a government that deserves scrutiny and causes me to fear that government. You want to take guns from people? Take them from the bad people. Mm -hmm. When you deny me my right to protect myself and those I love, you make yourself my enemy, and I don't like that. I've dedicated my life to protecting my country and my citizens in this state. To be returned the favor of being told I'm evil because I like to to own a gun and protect my family is insulting. There are a lot of rules and regulations and gun laws out there already that nobody wants to enforce. Watch the news, all right? Why is it when a police officer goes into a McDonald's and shoots the guy who walked in there with a gun who was threatening the lives of 15 people, why do people like you Common citizens, you phrase it, the officer killed the guy. No, that lowlife killed himself with the officer's gun. Suicide by cop. That officer is a hero because he saved the 14 innocent people inside. It is that simple-minded mentality where we don't stand up for the people who are doing good and condemn those who are doing bad. Some junkie takes a gun, knife, baseball bat, frying pan, I don't care, weapon, and uses it against somebody else. Everybody wants to say, it's not his fault, he has an addiction. I don't care, he's a criminal. Charge him, and while he's incarcerated, give him the help he or she needs. I'm fed up with having to defend myself because when I carried a fully automatic machine gun and walked around B-52 bombers to protect the United States of America, I was a hero. And now that I'm a civilian and I'm retired, my right to have a firearm gets challenged. That's absurd. I would ask one big favor. Before you go make any other laws that you're not going to enforce, collect all the ones that are laying out there right now, being ignored, and enforce those. By all means, go after the people that need to be gone after. But who knows? I may be in the supermarket that you're shopping in when something bad happens. Do you want me to be able to defend you? Or do you want me to duck for cover because I cannot defend you or me? Think about that. Thank you. Gentlemen back, we've got about a few more uh, opportunities, but the gentleman in the back in the plaid shirt. Yep. Thank you, Representative Day and all the members of the legislature that are here. I just have one question here. Uh, 
Why do you pass laws and apply them retroactively? You mentioned when you started this discussion that you wanted to focus on fairness. I'm a lawyer, I'll tell you what fairness is. I represent a guy, he's 60 years old. When he was 28 years old, he got convicted of possession of cocaine. Okay, that became a permanent LTC disqualifier at that time. After five years, he was able to get an FID card. He got the FID card, he's had an FID card for the last 20 or 30 years and he's renewed it time and time again. But this time around, he couldn't renew it. Chief, how many times have you run into this situation? Sorry, buddy, I can't renew your license. Yeah. Why does that, are these guys just collateral damage in this whole scheme of gun control? This is, complete, this is completely unfair. Guy never did anything wrong in his life. So what's he, he's out of luck now. It was applied retroactively. You take a look at your juvenile court. Up until the juvenile court became an actual juvenile court. Juvenile court was kangaroo court. Kids had no rights whatsoever. You walked in there, you were coming out of there with an adjudication of delinquency, like it or not. Then the record, there were no procedural perceptions for kids in juvenile court. Now those juvenile felonies are coming back to bite them in the ass 30, 40, 50 years later. Where is the fairness, Representative? How do you justify that, folks? Retroactive application. My guy can't get his, he can't renew his FID card anymore. He just wants to go hunting and shooting. He has no, he doesn't want to carry a handgun to enhance his masculinity. He just wants to go hunting and shooting, but he can't do that anymore. Thank you, folks. What do you say to that, sir? Appreciate the point. Yeah. On the red. My name is Charlie Bleemer. I live in Holyoke. Uh, I'm a lifelong hunter and shooter. I'm also a volunteer uh, hunter ed instructor with Mass Wildlife. And so I would like to repeat, uh, everyone is welcome to come and take a hunter ed course and it's free. And it can be a real eye opener to you about not just firearms, but conservation and everything. But what I wanna speak on is uh, for 15 years, I was involved in the firearms industry. I was a salesman for a distributor back when salesmen actually called on stores before the internet. Uh, and the idea of blaming manufacturers, gun dealers, distributors for something that someone else did that's totally out of their control is, is ludicrous. Um, you can't sue somebody because they sold a product legally to someone and that person used it illegally. If I'm hit by a drunk driver, that drunk driver can go to jail. Perhaps the bartender that served them too much is liable, but Ford or General Motors is not. And that's the same thing it, it should be and, and has been with the firearms industry. As a salesman going into stores, I saw gun dealers make judgment calls refusing to sell a firearm to somebody because they knew he wasn't going to be the owner, that it would be a straw sale, uh, and it put their, their uh, business on the line. They have a lot of rules and regulations, Toby knows that, that they have to follow, and they do have to make some judgment calls sometimes. So, blaming a firearm, an inanimate object, for a crime that's committed just doesn't, doesn't matter. These so-called assault rifles, all rifles are less than 5% of the homicides in the United States. Not just so-called assault rifles, but all firearms. And I just wanna say that, you know, Cain killed Abel with a rock, David killed Goliath with a rock. It's about good and evil. It's not about the rock. It's not about the... It's not about the bad. Also, when uh, we talk about statistics, you know, some wise man once said, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. When we talk about how many deaths of children happen with firearms, and that depends on what you define as a child. An 18 or 19 year old soldier that drives a tank, well, he's a man, he's a serviceman. An 18 or 19 year old airman that flies a jet, he's a man. 
We can't call an 18 or 19 year old gang member in Compton or Mattapan a child. And that's what happens with these statistics. We call anyone under the age of 20 or in some cases even older than that a child. And that gives us the fake statistics of firearms being the number one killer of children. That's, that's just nonsense. That's just not true. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be respectful of um, Greenfield's time, so we'll take uh, one more. Over in the corner. My name is Kathy, and I'm an Army veteran. Um, I almost lost my life in Iraq, but I signed up for that, to defend this country and for what it stands for. When I came home, I almost lost my life because of stupidity. Somebody gave somebody a firearm illegally that almost took my life. Now, in regards to children losing their lives, it's not the guns. It's the people who are irresponsible who are not securing their guns properly. I've been a gun over for 30 years, and by the grace of God, I thank God I never had to use it for my defense, or I never had an incident because they're secured properly. In regards to the laws, first of all, sir, we should start securing our borders because we don't know who's coming into this country to harm us. Furthermore, in regards to the laws, like that gentleman said, the laws are being used against the wrong people. We're law-abiding citizens who have the right to bear arms, to protect ourselves, because our fearless leaders in D.C. defunding the police well, I'm my first responder because it takes maybe five to ten minutes for the police to get to my house. And being a woman, I'm not being sexist here, but if I have a 275-pound guy, there's no way I'm going to be able to take him. But if I have a gun, well, that equals the fight. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm looking for violence. Please don't think that. My heart breaks for all the lives that have been lost. But it's not the guns. I could have a gun right here. That gun will not hurt anybody. It's the person behind the gun. And if that's the case, if that's the way people are thinking, then stop suing the people who make forks and knives because a lot of people are obese. I'm sorry, that sounds stupid, but it's stupidity, the laws that are being passed. You should protect the citizens of this great country and go after the bad guys. Because I can tell you this, if you take our guns away, crime is, will increase because the bad guys are not going to abide by the laws. And I thank you for your time. I'd like to thank uh, everybody. I'll be around for a little bit after this. But I'd like to thank everybody coming out and participating tonight. I want to particularly stop and thank uh, Greenfield Community College again for hosting us, making this space available for this dialogue. Truly appreciate it, uh, Madam President. I also want to thank our panelists, uh, Chief Michael Mason, John Pajak and Toby Leary. For your insight and your work, and for the Greenfield Plus delegation uh, for welcoming us out here, for bringing us out here from Boston to hear from you all. Truly appreciate it. Stay tuned. Chairman, is here, if people want to offer testimony. Sorry. Thank you, Representative Whips. Always sharper than I am. Uh, please do um, send in written testimony, or not testimony, but your, your thoughts. Letters, written um, suggestions, um, anything you want to share with us as we continue to consider. We're still in the intake phase um, on this uh, tour, so please do send it in. You can send it directly to me at michael.day, M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot D-A-Y, at mahouse.gov, M-A-H-O-U-S-E dot G-O-V. Uh, we welcome it all. Uh, I'm sorry? The next stop, well, so we've had a little challenge in pulling these together logistically. Uh, we're hopeful tomorrow to be able to announce the remaining stops as one, one go. Uh, but I believe the next one is in? Brockton. Brockton. On May 8th. Brockton, May 8th, from 6 to 8 p.m. That'll be in uh, one of the middle schools in Brockton. We'll give you uh, uh, more information hopefully tomorrow when we have the remainder of the stops ironed up. So please stay tuned. Uh, thank you for your participation. Stay engaged. And we appreciate it very much. Have a great night.